so what I was thinking was, I think the most powerful thing is stories, um, personal stories with Elizabeth, Kitty, Jane, uh, personal experiences that relate to being here and, and for me. So anyway, my, my sense was we, we take turns, um, we each get a run and and then there can be questions and other, other input. I know some of you were here back then and Dawn came along shortly after Denny and I did, but we both came in 1974, I believe. And uh, Denny and I met on the Center Beach in July 1974, working with Happy Club. Uh, so I'm not sure if everybody knows about Happy Club, but that was a program that the center ran for poor black children from downtown, downtown communities. And uh, Jane and her children, and Elizabeth uh -huh. especially, had close connection with those communities. And every Saturday, they would bring, they'd drive up a couple of cars full, I believe, usually, up to the center, give them lunch, and play at something. If it was beach weather, go to the beach. So this one Saturday, uh, Jane wrote me in quickly when I moved here and down at the beach and um, I was used to meeting honestly a lot of intellectual young guys and then you know, off in the distance in the beach is this guy who looked like he grew up in a gym and I said well, who was that and he turned around and it was Denny and I said oh it's him I'm like yeah this guy's utterly familiar and he saw me and I guess he had a similar kind of recognition and we've actually been buddies ever since and even if we have not at times spoken for years as soon as we speak we just we just pick right up it's just this deep connection um, so I, I'll go back a little bit in my history some of you heard me speak several months ago about uh, my experience at Mayor Baba and mediation and consulting and you know some spiritual work and I said I had to include a little bit of my story with God which started in high school because it led me into that the whole realm and me being here now um, so I was given this incredible unfolding awakening with nameless formless God in high school and it started when I was 15 years old started with great dissatisfaction with life as was presented to me very narrowly I thought and I said uh, if this is it it's a bad joke and the Marx Brothers are running it or something and I didn't even know where this came from I said I'm gonna take a chance there's more and this just came to me I said I want three things I want truth with a capital T I want to know the truth underneath everything. I want happiness with a capital H. I want to be profoundly happy and I want to feel really good about myself. And again, I didn't even know where that came from and I just sort of threw it up there. I was, it came going to bed one night. Well, then I learned where it came from. Uh, shortly after that, this presence started appearing subtle 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 at first is actually this feeling a little bit of light and every night when i went to bed before i went to sleep i would just lay there and connect with this presence and start to wonder who is this presence but it became stronger the light got brighter more expansive and eventually i realized it was actually guiding me and uh, awakening me bit by bit by bit, day after day. Ultimately, the, I, the presence identified itself as the source of the capital S, and I actually saw that inside in my mind's eye. And then one night it said, I am nameless God. And I, I said, why me? <laughs> you know, I'm this 15-year-old kid in high school, what do I know? And he just said, it's meant to be. Just pay attention to me, and I knew my life would never be the same again. So, anyway, over about the course of a year, this this 
awakening and unfolding took place where God would stir things in me to be faced in, in me. Uh, judgments, assumptions, annoyances, um, ego limitations, that, that's what it was. And I had to do my best to wrestle with them, get under them, face them square on, and whenever I finally <clears throat> satisfied God with how much I wrestled with them, he just took them. He, he literally took them away and eventually said, I'm peeling veils of illusion from in front of your eyes. And then I read that in the discourse years later. But uh, this, ex this connection with God became so immediate, so close, that uh, I didn't even want my own thoughts and questions because it took me away from my connection with God. And this was, talking waking life, I was, I was in school, I had a summer job, you know, this was, I was not floating in the air, this was grounded, and, and he inspired me to be good to others, to be kind, to reach toward others. If I saw somebody who seemed to be troubled, check it out with them, see if I could do anything, see how are they. Try to be cheerful, humorous, conscientious about things, do my best. He, he was training me, real, really, personally and internally. And the, the presence was so strong that, that seriously, my own thought or question would take me away from just the immediacy of him. It, it, it's impossible to really describe it, but it was... Uh, it became heaven on earth, it, it really did, and it got to the point that he was blazing away all the time. If I went to sleep, he was blazing away in my sleep. If I had a dream, I knew I was dreaming, and he was blazing away in the dream. And it was finally, I, I was perceiving a veil between us. It got thinner and thinner and thinner, and finally he said to me, it was this chasm one night, and he just said, leap. And it was like that famous painting with God reaching toward, you know, re reaching through the heavens. And, and I looked at this chasm with no bottom, and I, I said, are you kidding? You know, I, you want me to leap across that? And he said, have I ever let you down? And I said, no. And he said, well, leap. And I did and he caught me beaming. But it really was this utter release of myself into his arms. It really was this utter faith in him. And that's what he was asking of me and inviting me to and making available to me. So he made this available. And I did not create this, this enormous gift. And my nightmare of nightmares came true. It ended very painfully took a long time. If it, had, if it had ended in a shot, I think it would have killed me. You know, it, it would have been too much, but the whole thing just got taken away. And I just, I crumbled. And there was no perceivable trace anymore. No trace left of God, nothing, no connection. Uh, and I, I was a broken young guy uh, finally, like they say in AA, I got sick and tired of being sick and tired. I got sick and tired of being me, this broken down person. But I, I was angry at God. I, I could not find him at all. Physically felt horrible every day. Mentally felt horrible. But I started making efforts again. And shortly after I started making efforts, Mayor Baba made himself known to me. And uh, so I was told about him one night. And as I was being told about him, he let me know, this was 1970, he let me know that he was the same as a nameless God who'd come to me when I was a teenager. And so there was no question immediately who he was. And I said, well, what do I do? And he said, now it's your turn to work your way back to me. I said, well, how do I do that? And he said, good luck. <laughs>
I mean, he literally said, good luck, and he did that. He, Baba was standing inside me here, and we're having this conversation, and he turned and walked away, and I, I went, are you kidding me? Good luck, really? But he gave me just a drop. He did not bring back the whole experience, and to this day, 50 years later, I, I do not have that experience that I had in high school. Life has never been the same again. But it's been 50 years of the journey to try to climb my way back toward him and stumble. Um, so moving here, after I finally finished college, I left twice and fi finally finished because of Adi K. Arani saying finish college and, and Kitty telling me finish college and then you can move here. I asked her about moving here. Yes, so I had a spirit of service in me already. So it was very important to me to be involved in the world. You know, I, it seemed like I met a lot of people who seemed to have an attitude of like, oh, you got to kind of put up with the world. you got to deal with it. But real life is being on the center or going to India or going to Baba events. And, and I felt like, you know, no, God revealed himself to me in the midst of everyday life all, all the time and my, my life is in the everyday world you know and do my best to try to carry him with me and find him there so after only several months of first living here I got involved with community volunteer services which uh, doesn't exist anymore in that form, but it, it was a nonprofit group started by, I believe, Jane and her children and, and some other community figures. It was the children and Jane. Yes. The kids started in school. In high school, yeah. And it, it grew into this wonderful program that mostly worked with the poor black communities downtown, not, not up here. Um, and sometimes white people also, but mo mostly with the blacks. And uh, so I met John Leiter and Mary. They weren't married yet. And they were the only two paid employees. I became the third paid employee. We each received a check for $350 at the beginning of every month, and we had to get through the month. And it was a miracle, and every month I ended up with, I'm not kidding you, like $3 in the bank, literally, <laughs> but had to be very disciplined about the money. So one miracle happened one time. I needed an exhaust system on my car, and the exhaust, exhaust system was $130. And I said, oh, well, I don't have $130. You know, I end up with $3 at the end of every month. But it was the middle of the month, so I, there was still money in the bank, and I said, well, I said, Baba, I think you want me to keep doing this work. I'm going to write the check, get the exhaust system on faith. And to this day, I don't know how, I ended up at the end of the month with $3 in the bank, and the exhaust system was paid for. So Baba gave me an exhaust system. Um, but it was a very simple life, but it, it changed my life. And, and Danny got involved some... Uh, to this day, I'm still in touch with some of the people from back then. Uh, some of you know Reverend Gauze. So I knew him as a 14-year-old juvenile delinquent. And he was the biggest pain in the neck kid of all of them down there. He would try to steal tools from us. Um, he'd rabble rouse, get the other kids trying to give us trouble but always with the biggest grin and the biggest laugh. So you loved him and you hated him at the same time. So little did I ever know, but years after, I was living on Cape Cod, and he called me one night at home, tracked me down, and uh, he said, you know what I'm doing now? And I, I repeated this story a while ago, and I said, I'm thinking maybe doing time, you know, from, <laughs> from how I knew him. And he said, I'm a minister. And I said, you, you're what? He said, I'm a minister. He said, do you know why? I said, I have no idea. He said, I wanted to be like you. I wanted to be like you and John and Mary. And I, I said, what? And I, I said, all right, 
now I'm sitting. I said, tell me the story. And he said, I went to Miss Jean. That was Jane Haynes. They were very close. And he said, Miss Jean, I, I want to be like them. What do I do? And she said, Augie, that was his nickname, how do you think you can serve? How can you best serve? He said, so I became a minister, and he's been a minister ever since. So did I ever have any idea that I and John and Mary and Denny were having that effect? You know, never, never. You know, it's a miracle. Um, so I, I thought one of the things to share was a sense of the, I'd have to say, the, Baba's presence being felt in unusual ways through this work. Um, so the first project I became project coordinator was called Neighborhood House, and this was Mary's remarkable conception of creating this child development center in the middle of nowhere in the woods, in race path in this poor, poor black neighborhood, planned it out with with community teachers and community figures and uh, got some funding and I got hired to be project coordinator. Michael Teich was the architect for given a small house which I think came from Longs and it was moved moved down and it was added on to, had to be renovated and turned into this child development slash community center and uh, trial by fire, but we, part of my job, I, you know, I had control of the checkbook, but I'd go out and try to get discounts on materials, discounts on services, and Denny used to come with me some, well, for a number of months, and Denny would just chime in in whatever way he could. Um, but we got to know these people, and uh, just changed our lives, and I think, we both felt this sense of shared humanity that, you know, it erased the colors. You know, it, it really did. Um, but uh, to give you one sense of uh, some of the magic, so there was a man named Julian Richardson at the time, who was, I, I believe at the time, and any you know I think the most powerful guy in, in Horry County. He was at the same time the chairman of county council, the road commissioner, director of the prison camp, which had an active chain gang, and he was a businessman all at the same time, and what Julian said went. So I got connected with him, and he ended up sending a chain gang of truck drivers, convicts, driving dump trucks, county dump trucks, full of fill to help build this road to build neighborhood house. And uh, so toward the end of the project, Julian and I, had, by then we were on first name terms, and he said to me, well, Stu, said, you got anybody to grade the lot yet around the building? I said, no, I haven't gotten that far. And he said, I'll take care of it. I said, oh, God, thanks. And I figured he'd have a convict do it. So he said, I'll meet you next Friday. I said, that, that's wonderful, thank you. So I showed up and he pulled in in his county car, took his microphone off the dashboard and he called the dispatcher and he said, I'm off the air the rest of the day. And he hung up the microphone and I thought, oh wow, he's staying with us the whole day. And we chatted for a couple of minutes and this county truck came in pulling the most beautiful brand new Ford tractor sitting up on this trailer and the driver unloaded it and I was waiting for the driver to start grading the lot and Julian to supervise it and instead Julian got up in the tractor and he personally graded Now you can tell these are deep memories. Personally graded the lot. So Mary, Mary Leiter showed up and, and there's only Mary could do. She stood next to me, she looked at me, she went. <laughs> See, seeing Julian on the tractor and she said to me, nobody would believe this. <laughs> and I said, no. Say, this, 
powerful, powerful guy just got touched simply with what was going on. And uh, this happened time and time again. Myrtle Beach had a big active air base at the time, and uh, it, it's where the airport is now. So I was connected with the head of heavy equipment there, the Sergeant Carter, and he was straight out of central casting. He looked like and acted like Rod Steiger from the movie In the Heat of the Night, like the Southern Sheriff. And uh, he sent this big bulldozer out to help build the road. You know, and this guy was in charge of all the heavy equipment at, at the air base. It was a big deal. So we needed a little more work with a bulldozer, and I called and I reached him at his office, and I said, Sergeant Carter, any chance we could get a bulldozer? And he said, ah, I might could get one out in two or three days. And I said, well, chance any sooner? He said, well, maybe if I twist things around, I could do it Wednesday. And I said, is that it? And he said, when do you want this thing? <laughs> and I said, today? <laughs> and there was a silence, and I thought, oh no, I've gone too far. And he said, I'll meet you at the corner in half an hour. So I went out and I waited for him, and he drove up in his Air Force pickup truck, and he got out and he came over to me like Rod Steiger with a cigar in his mouth. And he came over to me sideways and he said, next time give me an hour. <laughs> and I said, I said, so do we have the bulldozer? He said, it's on the way. And we waited and this huge caterpillar bulldozer came along on a flatbed trailer <laughs> being pulled by an Air Force truck and he finished, he finished the road for us. So th these connections were, were amazing, and this happened again and again and again, where uh, we had th these interactions with, with the community. It's a great story. Denny was with me. I, I forget how this even happened, but for some reason I ended up having a meeting with county officials on the side of Highway 501. We all had our cars pulled over, and the, the health commissioner was there and some other high-level guy and a couple of county cops and um, I, I forget how it even happened but we were talking about the project and uh, well the cops just pointed to Denny and me so who are these guys you know gruff and one of the county officials without blinking he said oh these are Miss Patterson's boys they're good boys and the cop just said oh and and Denny and I just looked at each other, so nobody ever said anything that we had any connection with Elizabeth Patterson, but they knew. And just by us being connected with her, we had street cred. We, we were in, you know, and that, that was such an example of her presence in, in you know, not, not just Myrtle Beach, but I mean, this was, these are county officials and God knows how far across the, the state, but she was revered, revered. And, you know, to be able to have these incredible connections with her, you know, Denny and I both had a lot of interactions with her, Kitty Elizabeth, and I'll, I'll say just a few more stories and then turn it over to Denny, but uh, after Neighborhood House, uh, a little while later, I ended up helping to frame the big addition to the meeting place on the center. And when I came back here in 2014, Dennis McCabe one night said to me in the meeting place, he said, come here, come here. He said, and he opened a cabinet and he said, I still have the original building permit from 1975 pinned up on the, on the wall inside this cabinet in the back of the meeting place. He said, I wanted you to see it. And then... Uh, Another project came up in another of the poor black communities, and this was, uh, we're given, turned out to be, didn't know it, a termite infested two story barn, which was a gift shop, and it was to be turned into a community center in this other black neighborhood. And Don was hired as lead carpenter, 
uh, I was a real novice at that point, and Don taught me about everything he knew. And um, you now he had amazing, uh, again, just a slew of amazing experiences with that. Uh, Julian Richardson, again, I called him one time and said, Julian, can I get a dump truck for a couple of days? He said, Stu, tell you what I'm going to do. He said, I'm going to give you a truck for four days. I said, oh, God, that's great. He said, now, you're going to leave your car at the prison camp, and you're going to take the county dump truck for four days, and that county dump truck is your vehicle for four days. <laughs> I said, really? We can do that? He said, I say we can do that. And I said, okay. So for four days, I used the dump truck at work and then drove it home at the end of the day, went food shopping with it, went to the laundromat with it, and you know, only in Horry County, and <laughs> it's a it's a comical memory. Um, it's another memory that stands out there. Uh, Jerry Llewellyn, at that point, some of you know, was a family service director after John Leiter went to law school. <clears throat> so. We're working on this termite-infested building, starting to take things apart, getting swarmed with termites. Mm -hmm. And there was this um, uh, rough alcoholic guy in his 50s named Thurman Brown, who lived in the neighborhood, lived in a falling-down shack. I mean, literally, he had he was like 12 coats, the must. He had extra coats and blankets for the winter because his place was literally falling down. The wind would bl blow through it. And we'd have sometimes open air evening meetings in this gutted building we're working on. And he'd come over and he'd be drunk and he'd interrupt and people would yell at him to leave. And, you know, it was, it was difficult. So he was this big, strong guy with a steel brace on his leg. I, I never knew what it was about the brace, but he was a strong, imposing guy, this great, deep voice. And I, I was used to him. I had already taken him to uh, Charleston Medical University Hospital for care a time or two, and we'd gotten to know each other a little bit. Uh, and so just a little bit of an aside, first time I did that, came back, was letting him out of the car, and he, we didn't know each other, but we spent a few hours on the road, and he said, come here. And it was deep voice, and he's a lot bigger than me, and I went over, and he said, come closer. I didn't know what he wanted, and I came closer, and he just stared at me. And then he took me, and he said, you're beautiful. So the same guy um, working on the building, he shows up one morning and he says to me, pull me up, because the building is first floor is pretty high off the ground. And I pulled him up and he said, put me to work. And I said, what? He said, you heard me, put me to work. And Jerry Llewellyn and I looked at each other and I said, well, what, what can you do? He said, what do you want me to do? And I said, well, I'm taking this floor apart. He said, give me the bar. I gave him this big crowbar, and Jerry and I looked at each other. Thurman went on taking the floor apart. Got close to noon, and Thurman said, time for lunch. Come on. And so Jerry and I looked at each other, and we are both figuring, well, he wants us to buy him lunch. And we said, well, where do you want to go? He said, Winn-Dixie, grocery store. Go to Winn-Dixie, and he marches over to the deli, and he picks up the biggest bucket of fried chicken I've ever seen in my life. It was like as big as Rhode Island. And Jerry and I figured, all right, we're buying fried chicken, and we get to the checkout, and Thurman, I still remember, the bucket of fried chicken was $7. Back then, like 1975, that was a lot of money. Thurman took out his food stamps, and he said, this is on me. He said, you, you guys are helping us. This is on me. And Jerry and I just looked at each other and we said, we have to let him do this. And, you know, you don't go through things like that and just not have your life utterly, utterly changed. So some years later, 
I, I was gone and I heard there was a, the biggest black church kind of stayed on him, finally reeled him in as a church member, got him into the choir because he had this incredible voice story. <coughs> so just a couple of personal stories. You know, the community is very close-knit. There were few secrets. Elizabeth and Jane and Kitty knew probably more than, than they wanted to know about everybody, but they also kept a very close eye. Um, but they, they had, aside from everything else they did to run the center and everything else, there, there was personal connections with all of us. So one night, Elizabeth called me and she said, I hear you're going to Boston, is that true? And I said, yes, uh, my wife-to-be and I were going to help my mother for a week. She said, would you do me a favor? And I said, sure. And she said, uh, Mayor Barber stayed at the Hotel Vendôme in Boston in 1931. Would you just go look up the hotel? I said, sure. So my wife-to-be and I, we felt like we're on a mission for God, <laughs> you know, from Elizabeth. So uh, we went in, it was this beautiful spring night in the old part of Boston, beautiful buildings and a few blocks from the Charles River, just a block in from Newbury Street, this famous, wide, wonderful street ran from Boston Common and the Public Gardens down to the big mothership, Central Boston Public Library. And we found the building. It turned out there'd been a big fire there, and they're turning it into condos and couldn't find anything else. So we're walking away, and we're walking down Newbury Street, and this drunk guy is staggering toward us. It, it's toward dusk, but you could see. And as he got closer, I saw fresh blood on his head. Came right up to us, and he uh, mumbled, asking for money. And I said, well, I've been taught not to give out money like this, thinking of the Mondelēk. In 1971 in India, they said, don't give money to beggars. And he raised his head and he looked at me with the clearest eyes and in the clearest voice. This was not the drunk guy. He said, will it kill you? And I just looked at him. It went right to my heart. And I said, no. And he said, well, this, again, this was not the drunk guy. And I took out my wallet and I had four $1 bills in it. That was it. I was very wealthy. And I took two and I gave him, I gave him half of what I had. And he thanked me, and he, and he became the drunk guy again, and he staggered away, and just stood there, and I, I looked at a street, my future wife, and I, I said, I feel like giving him a Baba card. I have some. And she said, yeah, yeah, go after him. And I hustled after him, and I, I took the a Don't Worry, Be Happy card, and I just I held it around in front of him, and I, I said, here's a smile to take with you. And he took the card and he touched it to his forehead like the third eye and he kissed it. I saw him do this and he put it, put it into the pocket of his jacket and I turned back around to look at Astrid and she was holding her head with her mouth open and I, I said, did you see that? And she went like that and we looked at each other and we turned back and he was gone. He, was dis he had disappeared. There's nowhere for him to go. This is my second disappearing man in my Baba experience, but that was part of our journey for Elizabeth. You know. um, I, I feel like I should turn over to Denny in a minute. Um, you know, I had, had just amazing experiences, so I'll, I'll just say one, one with Kitty too. Kitty called me one night and she said, oh, uh, there's a man staying on the center. I think you should meet. I meet. I don't know why, but I think you two should meet. Can you come over to Dilruba? I said, sure. So went over to Dilruba, and uh, Kitty wasn't even right there. And there's this guy, and we look at each other, and we say, "Do you know why we're here?" And we both go, "No." You now it turned out it was John Dennison, and at that point, John didn't know it, but some months later, in, in how should we say, cahoots with Kitty, Kitty being closely involved with this, I think she helped get him to apply to become the 
director of alcohol and drug abuse in Horry County because uh, the state was busy opening alcohol and drug abuse centers throughout and they actually became a model for the entire country. Uh, South Carolina amazingly became uh, one of the best. They really did. They had a great director. John became director of the Horry County Alcohol and Drug Abuse and uh, the next year and John and I started developing a connection together and the next year then Kitty called me again. She said, oh, um, John has a position coming open. I think you should talk to him and apply for it. So uh, this was as an outreach counselor, and there's a federal salary for it for a limited time. And I applied, got hired, uh, eventually became certified by the state as an addictions counselor. So just a few examples of you know, how, how incredibly intimate the connections with Elizabeth and Jane and Kitty were. Um, you know, and both these guys, you know, dating from way back, you know, have, uh, how should we say, just stayed close in, in my life in, uh, in, in different ways. And I see Bob's hands in all of it for sure, so. I think it's time for this fellow. Thanks, Stu. This is uh, bringing back a lot of memories. Having Don be here brings back a lot of memories. We, we've been crossing each other's paths for years now, ever since uh, the very beginning. But it, it, wouldn't have, uh, it wouldn't have happened, of course, if we hadn't somehow taken a leap to uh, look for the avatar. And uh, thus it was with myself too in the beginning. It just little kind of lost in life and, and uh, always had the idea that uh, I should focus on God. I had no way of figuring out how to go about that. My father just died when I was four and, and uh, my sister said, uh, well, I, I asked her, I said, what do we do now? You know, well, where's our dad? And uh, Mama's at quite a loss. Uh, didn't even know how to sign a checkbook. But anyway, my sister said, well, we, 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 uh, we pray. And uh, she was 12 years older. And she said, uh, we ask God for help. And so this is still the idea of God in my mind. And as I went through school, uh, contemplating and praying, you know, daily prayers. Uh, I'm thinking there's got to be more to this. We get to uh, high school, and, and um, actually in junior high, Jeff Wolverton and I met. And um, Jeff was uh, at the time a very, uh, I think he would have claimed himself to be atheist at the time, but uh, as we got done with high school, he was moved up to a agnostic, and uh, <laughs> he was on his way. But it, it was uh, um, exploring, exploring deeper and deeper, and I remember uh, we got to college now at this point. Jeff goes back to New York City, and um, he's at Columbia University, and uh, I'm off in, in Bremerton to a junior college over there, and we got together this uh, second summer, and we're sitting up on, we decided to take a walk, and we're sitting up on our junior high school roof, and um, we're saying, what's next? I mean, what are we, what are we doing in this life, anyway? And um, uh, I said, I think, Jeff, that uh, Christ is here somewhere, and he said, you know, I, I think so, too, and uh, we made up our minds at that point that we're going to find where Christ is. And uh, it's not just that, um, you know, he's here and isn't that wonderful, but we're going to find where he's at. And about this time, uh, I get my draft notice, and I'm off to war. <laughs> and uh, Jeff, uh, a stubborn rascal, he had nothing to do with that. Uh, he, he was about to become a conscious objector, but um, conscientious objector. But I got together with him in, in uh, 
once in, in uh, Columbia University there, and um, uh, I was in my uniform, and um, I called up on the phone and I said, uh, you know, where are you anyway? What area? He said, well, whereabouts are you at? And I told him, he said, oh, you're in the wrong area. That's Harlem. Get out of there quick. And uh, I had such peace and calm in, in Harlem. I felt like there was, there was a completely safe, completely safe. Anyway, off I went to the, the uh, travel around the world. When I got back, uh, I spent a couple years in Ethiopia and a year in Turkey. And, and this whole time I'm thinking, where is this God? Where is, where is God? And how to, how to get involved with him again? Uh, how to find out? Well, four years is gone, and I get discharged in New York City and uh, Staten Island, and I go immediately to uh, Manhattan and start looking around for Jeff. I figured maybe he's still in college, and um, uh, I wasted a, a week or so trying to find him. And finally, I sat down in the rotunda in Columbia University, and I said, I'm not leaving until I find Jeff or find out where he's at. And I finally spot this guy walking across the, the uh, campus. And um, I said, my gosh, that guy looks familiar. Really and I race over to him, and it's uh, this fellow, Danny Silverblatt. And I asked him if, uh, if he knows where Jeff's at. He says, yeah, he's up in Schenectady. And I said, Schenectady, what's he doing up there? And he said, well, he's, he's uh, up there studying about some Indian gods. <laughs> and I thought, oh, this is interesting. Uh, it must be the Mohawks or the Iroquois or something like that. <laughs> so uh, I said, well, how do I get a hold of him? And he said, well, if there's this guy, Michael something. And um, so I spent a couple of days trying to, to locate him, and, and I can't find him. And, and I'm running out of time. I've got to get moving. I've got to get on to uh, Europe, uh, get my things down to my sisters down in D.C. and drop them off. And um, um, I, I think I spent a week there saying hello. And then um, I've got to meet this fellow in, in, in Frankfurt. And so uh, get my ticket, take the bus up from D.C. and. Um, the day before I take off to go up there to New York to get the, the plane, um, I'm thinking, how in the world am I going to get a hold of Jeff? And I remember his folks live in, in uh, Vancouver, British Columbia. So I call up, up there and uh, um, ask information for Charlie uh, Wolverton, and I get a telephone number for him, and I call up the house and and it's, uh, his mother, Elizabeth, answers the phone. And uh, I grew up in the same neighborhood together. And, uh, Jeff and I were the closest buddies since junior high onward. So um, anyway, uh, I said, how, how can I get a hold of Jeff? And she said, well, he lives up in Schenectady, but uh, he doesn't have a phone. And uh, I said, well, is there any way I can possibly get a hold of him? She said, yeah, get a hold of this uh, uh, fellow Michael Levine if he can. And I said, do you have a telephone number for him? She said, yeah, uh, here, you know, and she gave it to me. And, and so I got on the bus the next morning, drove up to um, New York, get off the phone at the bus station, and I've got about four hours before I take off for, for uh, Frankfurt. And I call Mike's house. And by gosh, Jeff just answers the phone. <laughs> he comes down from uh, Schenectady uh, and he does this maybe about every six months for his army physical. And he's still, they're still trying to uh, get him into the army so he can go off to war. And, uh, and he keeps avoiding this, doing a good job. But he raises his heartbeat. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, so he'd, he'd be good for another few months. Anyway, um, he said, where are you? And I told him. And he said, uh, well, give me 10 minutes. Uh, he said, uh, see, see if there's anything familiar you can put out, point out. And I said, well, there's a hot dog stand down here. He says, I know where you're at. 
So uh, down he rushes, and he, and he, uh, we meet. And uh, I said, you know, I've been, I've been wondering uh, about this idea. Have you heard anything, any idea where, where uh, God might be? And he said, yeah, I, he said, I do. I have a pretty good idea. Uh, he said, I'm, I'm uh, living up in Schenectady to be around Darwin and Gene Shaw. And um, uh, he said, once a week we get together for these meetings and um, So um, uh, he said, but anyway, um, he said, you're taking off for Europe right now. And he gives me a card. Don't worry, be happy. I'm the divine beloved who loved you more than you can ever love yourself. And, um, uh, and he said, when you come back, look me up. And uh, we'll, we'll, uh, I'll tell you more about this. And, I, and so I take off for Europe. And I'm thinking, uh, you know, Maybe this, you know, there might be something to this, but uh, we didn't have that much time to talk or anything. So, how do you how do you put all this together in a couple hours? <laughs> and uh, so, off to Europe I go and, and uh, to meet this this fellow, and he never shows up. We're supposed to meet at the uh, uh, embassy, American embassy there in Frankfurt, and uh, this fellow Michael never shows up. And so I'm thinking, well, what do I do now? And uh, I said, Jesus, I guess uh, it's just you and I. We're going to travel around Europe here for a couple of months before I go back to uh, New York. And, and we did. And it was the, the most uh, touching <coughs> spiritual experience that uh, it was amazing. It was just God and, and, and I. Trying to take a look at this picture and put this whole thing together, it sounds... Sounds interesting, but it's it's way beyond. His name isn't Jesus, first of all. It's Mary Baba, <laughs> and, and I'm looking for Jesus. You know, long hair, and this this isn't uh, the, it doesn't fit the picture. Anyway, I get back uh, after a month and a half of being over there, and it was just an absolutely a trip with God. It was amazing, and um, one experience after another. But uh, get to New York. And um, got a couple hours to kill. And um, I call back to, to Michael Levine's house. Jeff answers the phone again. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he'd come down just by chance again for another armored physical. They really want this guy, you know. <laughs> and he's standing out in the streets protesting. He and Ken Rickstad uh, are going to Columbia University. And, and they've just about shut down. Columbia University and all these protesters. It was kind of getting messy. Anyway, um, so we, we talked together that night. And I said, uh, uh, I said, the next morning when we got together, I said, uh, you guys have to come on out and get me if I'm not back here by February. And uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, it, it's time to say goodbye and, and, and we stand up and they want a hug. I'm a soldier. We don't hug. <laughs> and um, anyway, uh, we wrap arms around each other, and I start crying. I mean, I'm really having troubles now. I know there's something to this, and um, and I'm going to get trapped out in Washington. I'm not going to be able to come back right away. And um, so we part ways, and... and um, I said, you know, you guys have to come on up and, and get me here, but if I'm not back, quick. Well, it didn't happen. <laughs> I stayed out in Washington, put a new uh, roof on the fence and built, I mean, uh, on the garage and built a fence and tended to things that needed to be done at the family house here. And uh, finally, summer came, uh, college was out, and uh, I'd hope to give someone from college a ride back to the to the west coast. I mean, to the east coast here, and run on up to Schenectady. And, and uh, anyway, long story short, I get back to Schenectady, and uh, I'm trying to get to Darman and Jean's house to find out, get the, the lowdown on on Baba. 
Darwin and Gene are so busy that uh, nothing's happening. You can't get together with them. So we'll go over to Schenectady and run into, I mean, to uh, Albany, run into Bobby and uh, uh, Ken Rickstad. I mean, yeah, Ken Rickstad and, and Ken Lux, they have meetings over there. Finally, I'm getting to hear about Bob. I mean, all day long we're talking about Bob. But um, more and more I'm, I'm able to find out about Bob. And how do you how do you put this beginning of when we hear about Baba? How do you put this into uh, making it a reality? And, 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 um, we we got a, a period of time where we made a trip down to the center, and uh, uh, on Fourth of July we had a, a meeting down at the Riley's house, Tom and Yvonne Riley's. Did you go down to that, Bobby? I don't, I, don't, I don't think you did. But that was when we sat down and I had the uh, Get Serious with Baba discussion with Darwin and Gene. And uh, I remember the whole time Darwin was talking, introducing this, this talk, uh, I'm sitting there laughing and crying. One moment I'm crying and I'm so full of joy. And the next minute I'm just overjoyed and I'm laughing and laughing. And Ken Lux on the way home says, you know, you got to simmer down, Denny. He said, you're, you're acting like it's, it's a little strange here. And he said, uh, and I got thinking about it. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, it was true now. Now it was true. Um, but how could it be true that, that Baba could be Jesus? And, and one and the same. Anyway, it, it made sense now. And... Um, we, we spent every day getting together, uh, Jeff and I and, and Barbara Heikov, uh, who is Barbara uh, Rickstad now, if you know Ken and, and Barbara Rickstad. Uh, we'd get together and daily we'd do things. Uh, we went camping and, and uh, we talked about Baba. Finally we came down to the center and um, it was in, in the 1st of July, I mean the 1st of August, end of July, 1st of August, and uh, stayed on the center for a couple of weeks. And what joy. I didn't get to meet Elizabeth. Uh, she was off in, in Europe. And I didn't meet uh, Kitty. And um, I didn't get my introduction. <laughs> but uh, everything was perfect. Everything was perfect. It was all the pop pop. And where do you go from here? Uh, I had a job to look forward to when I went back to uh, uh, New York and uh, working with children. That was a job that I had before I went into service. And uh, uh, so we went back after after spending a week, a couple of, uh, well, we left uh, the day after my birthday, August 9th, and we drove back up to uh, Schenectady and, and um, uh, I met this girl down at the center, and she was from Florida. And oh, this is a romance of my life. And this this girl is really special. <laughs> and we we made these uh, telephone calls and 24-hour letters mailed back and forth until I was convinced we were going to get together. And I I thought I see her on neutral territory. And then I'll find out if there's really something because people were, had warned me. Said, Don't put all your life into a, a relationship at this point. You've got Baba now. And, and learn to live that. And I said to myself, yeah, but you know what? Uh, this is kind of special. Well, anyway, she showed up in a week and um, up in Schenectady. And um, uh, I promised her if she came up, I drive her back down to Florida, and by the time we left New York, it was so obvious that there was nothing between us. It was like, why did I ever make that promise? And uh, but anyway, I did. We got down to uh, Florida, dropped her off, and now I've got to get back up to to New York. And uh, I called Irwin Luck, 
and I never met him or anything, but uh, the woman said, get a hold of him, maybe you can stay with him for a while. And uh, so we, we, uh, we got together, and I moved up with him to uh, George and Adele's house. Uh, and Adele and, and George had a little tiny room up there that uh, Erwin and I took over, and we started peddling on the streets. Make a, a little bit of money to uh, do film work. All these beautiful movies that people had given to Herman, uh, movies of Bob, and they had to be, uh, some of them had to be developed, others had to be cleaned up, and uh, so we spent months doing that together. We're making really good money, peddling on the streets, and uh, we'd make a couple hundred dollars a day apiece, and, uh, and we didn't have any expenses, and we put these into the, the movies. Uh, I mean, the, the uh, yeah, to repairing the movies. And my life be began to be really deeply involved in things like that. Um, and all of a sudden, here we were at Christmas time, and Ermin said, I'm going, I'm going down to uh, home for Christmas. And um, I think we had a couple hundred dollars, and, and he said, we can split it up, and you can... Uh, do whatever you want until after Christmas and we can get back together. Well, Jeff and Ken came down on the way to, to uh, uh, India. And we talked about it and they said, why don't you come with us? I said, gee whiz, I, you know, I don't have that kind of money. And uh, they, they really got into being, putting, you know, serious about this. And um, the next day I got this, this check from back home. Uh, some money I'd loaned this guy, and, and it turned out I had enough money. I think I had $800. The plane ticket was $500. And um, a passport, I had to change my passport. But I, I was able to go to, in, in four more days, I was able to go and join Jeff and, and Ken over there in India and meet the Mondoli. And uh, incredible. This is really moving fast. And, uh, Pardon me? What year was that? That was 1971. And um, uh, things were happening really quick. And I thought, oh my God, what would it be like to to, uh, to live in India? And just uh, Christmas, we were standing out, uh, we're standing in front of Mera on the porch. and said, why don't, you, why don't you all sing Christmas carols? And uh, yeah, here's it nice balmy day in, in uh, India singing Christmas carols. And we start off with, I'm dreaming of white Christmas. <laughs> and uh, the wind hits this block mori tree and all these white petals <laughs> float down. And, I'm, and I'm, I'm, I choke up. I'm looking up in the uh, room where Baba used to have upstairs there. And I'm thinking, you rascal, you're in that room. And uh, uh, looking out here, I said, why don't you just kind of pull the drape back a little bit so I can see you? You know, and, and so about that time, we're, we're back to the chorus of White Christmas and snowflakes falling, and the wind hits this Glockamore tree again, down from these petals. I, I'm just standing there crying anymore. I can't see. <laughs> this, is, this is finally what the Christmas presents were about, the presence of Christ. And I realized what had happened. The whole... The thing have really blended together now. Christ and, and Baba were one. And uh, anyway, um, what what amazing days we have. One day we're sitting out in front of the, the little place where I think there's room for about seven guys to, to stay in this one house. And we're talking about uh, how is there going to be enough room for people to stay here in the future. And James Cox is, is talking about building this Pilgrim Center. I'm thinking, yeah, I can go back and maybe make enough money for buy 200 cement blocks and add an addition on for two more people. And, and Charlie uh, Morton is, is talking about making stained glass windows for the tomb. And I'm thinking, you know, where do we go from here? What what happens? Well make a long story short, we get back to the United States 
and I go back to George and Dell's, and, and Urban and I start pedaling again, and, and um, then he's got all these tapes, and uh, I've got special equipment um, making reel-to-reel -reel audio, so, so we can keep all these records of, of movies and videos and. And I'm getting immersed in that again, and and it's it's just a beautiful night. What more could you want? Well, we decide to, to split up, and um, and, I, and I, I'm thinking now what? Uh, don't have a job, and um, this that project's done, and Urban's off to doing something else, and. I asked James Cox if he has room for uh, an extra person, and, and we get a place up on uh, um, Scarsdale. He starts his business, and I'm, I'm working with the juvenile delinquents, and I'm working with uh, uh, this uh, liquor business, making bottles. Uh, I'm not making bottles, but that's the manufacturing. And so I'm making a, an okay income and everything. And one day James says, "Could you uh, could you drive a, a, a truck, rent a truck, and um, I've got a shipment of things coming in from India, and uh, I need to get them from the airport." And I'm thinking, why don't I help in this project too? I don't have to be doing these other jobs. And so that's that's what happens. Uh, now we get stuff from the airport, we, we bring it to the uh, office he has in New York City, and, and we start selling bed spreads and we start to, uh, things like that. He's got this business going where he's going to raise some pretty good money, to, he thinks, to, uh, to build a pilgrim center in India. And this goes along for a while, and I'm deeply involved in that. And pretty soon I'm, I'm off to go to back to India to live and work at the, uh, the clothing factory that he's got over there. And that falls apart. That, that, uh, he's got someone else running it. But I was just ready to go back to India and I'm thinking, well, now what? Uh, and so I take the savings and I do go back. And I arrived there and I've got a couple hundred dollars second trip in a year and uh, I mean it's a year uh, and I'm here I'm taking my next trip back there and, I, and I'm thinking now what do we do and I lose my billfold and I have no money and um, Monty comes up and she says well uh, if you want uh, you can take care of Dr. Gore's father Pop Sirani and uh, you can stay at his place. And I said, yeah. And uh, she said, if, if you would like, uh, you can come and work at the trust during the day, typing and things like that. And, Whoa, yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, so I do this until summer and, and uh, well, until March, when the Mondali no, are no longer working at the trust and she said, if you want, uh, we're going to be going back to the house and, and it's too hot to work in town. We're not going to be doing that. Uh, but you can stay and take care of Pop Sirani and, and uh, then next year we'll get back to coming into Amanagar and working at the Trust. And I'm thinking, this could be a good life, but I'm going to lose my ticket. And uh, maybe I'd better go back to the States while they're, while they're doing what they're doing. And... Uh, get some money to uh, get another ticket and go back next year. And so that's what I start to do. And uh, I'm thinking, that was the stupidest thing by the time I'm on the plane. That's the stupidest thing. If someone could give me a ticket when I hit New York, I get back on that plane and go back. And uh, the heck with this. <laughs> I want to live in India. I want to be there. And... Uh, Anyway, it doesn't work that way. Nobody hands me a ticket when I get off the plane. And um, I have 
some way of getting down to, to Myrtle Beach, and I do that. And uh, what happens next, I don't know. Uh, I live with Jeff down there for a while, and um, about that time, uh, I, I started helping out with uh, Happy Club with the children, and uh, it's spring, and um, Barbara Rickstad comes down and she tells me about this guy, Stu Baker, and, and uh, coming down, she says, you really got to meet this guy, you, you're going to love him. <laughs> and a couple months go by and, and Stu shows up and, wow, he re it really is, he's a neat guy. <laughs> We've got the same thing in mind, just to, to be with Baba. And, um, and then, then uh, Stu gets this job and... Uh, uh, and, and it's possible to, to go on down there and just hang out during the day and, and help too, you know, not uh, nothing specific, but just help out with the construction. And pretty soon, you know, we're, we're uh, getting a snicker bar and having a good time laughing and, and uh, uh, getting some progress going there. Meeting these guys, Elizabeth has this idea of... Uh, uh, finding out what the, the sewage and water is like in black communities and try to put this before the board of Myrtle Beach to get water and sewer into the black areas. And she asked if I was interested in taking on the project. And, uh, gee whiz, yeah, I guess. You know, go around and check the houses. And, uh, so I got involved with that. Elizabeth uh, somehow had a way of, of getting you involved in things. <laughs> Uh, and then there we were, but I didn't have money and things like that. It turned out that after uh, we got the school done, uh, we had to get, I mean, in, in getting the school done, um, we had to, to get, uh, uh, let me let me hand you this back, Stu, and let you tell a little bit about the, the, uh, the fences. The coke. Remember the, the fences that you, the uh, pallets. Oh. oh. So we, we developed this relationship with the air base. You know, I mentioned Sergeant Carter, and we also got to know the procurement officer at the base, and uh, so he got in touch with me, and and he said we have these wooden pallets and rocket motor crates. He said, um, we, need, we need to uh, make a contract with somebody to take these apart and take the wood away. Do you guys want to bid on the contract to do this and maybe you could use some of the wood on your project? And I said, well, I have no idea how to bid on this. He said, well, just come up with something. I said, I, I really have no idea. I said, can you give me a guideline? He said, no, I'm not supposed to do this, but no, I think something like that figure ought to, ought to work. I said, all right, that, that's our bid. So he said, okay, you got it. And so we'd go to the air base every day and work taking apart these wooden pallets and rocket motor um, crates. It, it, it was just kind of comical. So Denny had been a gymnast, right? And so this one day there was also this pile of steel bed springs. And Denny said, I think I can do a backflip on that. I said, oh, God, Denny, don't, don't. He said, no, I, I think I can. I said, oh, Denny, please. So he tries doing a backflip, and he comes down in a heap on this steel <laughs> bed spring. <laughs> but it, it was... Uh, it was an interesting time. We we didn't actually get to make much use of the wood. It was it was kind of in pieces, but we we got paid something that went back into the project, you know. And and we just developed more relationships being at the base. So. I wasn't quite thinking of the the, uh, the flip shoe, <laughs> but uh, I remember. There there was a, a check that. Uh, 
that came into this, and it was three hundred dollars. Uh, is that right? I thought it was less, but I'm, I'm not sure. Anyway, um, so uh, I didn't have any money, in it, and Stu decides that uh, that I need this money, and it was three hundred, as I recall it, and. Um, so you, you, you went ahead and gave me that check, and I could eat again. <laughs> um, I, I had asked Elizabeth, I was wanting to ask Elizabeth about work, and she said, uh, on the center, and she said, uh, um, well, Lee is getting ready to, to build a cabin, the farm shed, and uh, uh, when he gets ready on that, uh, would you help him on that? And I said, yeah, I would love it. Now, I, I, I did want to work on the center, but I was hoping for a night watch job. Jim Myers uh, was getting married, and uh, um, I thought maybe he wouldn't be doing the night watch anymore, and that would be ideal. But Elizabeth had this idea of doing this, uh, and I said, you know, how could I refuse it? There was an opportunity for a job. And so she said, uh, we're going to hold off, though, until the spring, uh, I mean, until the fall. Perhaps what you could do is uh, clean cabins in that until that time. Would that be all right? And I said, yeah, that would be fine. And uh, uh, so it turns out that... Uh, now I'm working at the center cleaning cabins, which is, is okay. I, you know, I had a job at the center. And uh, this went on and on and on until the fall, and Don moves down. <laughs> and uh, Lee decides now what he's going to do is have Don uh, help build the farm ship. And uh, now I've got a long ongoing job at the center cleaning cabins, doing things like that. What a wonderful job, but I, I really hadn't planned on doing anything. I'm just getting more and more involved with living and working at the center. And um, uh, amazing things that happened. I, I wind up getting married. Stu's uh, married at this time, too. and. And our lives are going along, and um, I really don't have enough money to for children. But I, I, I marry a Renata; she already has a, a daughter, and then uh, we have a, a child. And it's not enough money just working at the center anymore. Um, so I need to start coming up with better income, and. Um, I started doing tree work, and um, pretty soon I've, I've got uh, a business that's uh, taking me away from the center, and I don't like that. <laughs> uh, one day at a time, uh, three years have gone by now, and I, I finally decide that to be fair to the, the other people that uh, are working for me, they really need full-time work. And I've worked myself out of a job at the center. And I, I, I really need to do that uh, with when the employees. Did you, when did you help out with you know, the work Dennis does, organizing programs? Did you do that? I think Jeff did that. I, d I, did, I did that uh, in the evenings. Yeah. Yeah, the Friday night uh, program. Yeah. But I guess where, where this is all headed is, is we live together in this city. Um, the Baba community wasn't all about doing a lot of work on the center. There was no room for volunteers in Elizabeth's uh, in the board back in those days. It was about um, uh, getting involved in the community. And, and that's what happened uh, with Stu and I. We, we get involved in the community and Don moves down. He's done with the farm shed and he's involved in the community. And um, uh, time came that I had to get a truck for work, and I went out and saw Julie, Julian Richards. I thought he might have a vehicle out there. 
he sold me this dump truck for like a couple hundred dollars. I mean, it probably should have been about four or five thousand dollars at least. The whole life has is, is just come together since, well, you all know that. You're all part of the community. Life comes together here. And pretty soon we, we've got this big, beautiful community and years have gone by and here we are. Here we are. How many now, people are living? How many uh, flower people? What year has this been? 74, 75? Yeah. How many people are living in the, uh, would you say, about it, the community? 150. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I guess that's, that's good. Anyway, um, I, I think.